dismissed to children's church up through third grade. As they're being dismissed, I want to invite you to turn to the 59th chapter of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 59. Would you join with me in prayer as we prepare our hearts to receive the Word of God this morning? Gracious Father, oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior you have have sent. Oh, what a Savior who has laid down his life, receiving in his body the punishment for our sins crucified, humiliated, beaten and scorned, giving his life, buried in a tomb, but risen indeed. Oh, Father, our hearts swell with rejoicing this morning. We rejoice in the risen Christ who has ascended and is now seated at your right hand. And Father, we give you praise today for the victory that is Christ Jesus, our Lord. Oh God, we humble ourselves before you this morning. We acknowledge our deep need for a Savior, for the Savior. We acknowledge that Jesus Christ alone is the Savior. He is the only one who can remove our sins. He is the only way, the only path that leads into your presence, into communion with you, Father. He is our only means of dwelling in you, dwelling with you and you with us. For it is your desire, Father, to dwell with your people. Oh God, I pray in these moments that your word would speak to our hearts, the word that has been spoken, the songs that have been sung from our hearts. And now, the word of God from Isaiah 59 and 60. May the risen Savior bring life to anyone here who is not yet living in Christ. Transform hearts, God. It is the work only you can do. I can't do it. I'm just a messenger today. God, use me as your mouthpiece, and I pray the Spirit of God would control every facet of my being, the words that proceed from my mouth, may they speak forth the truth of your glory, the riches of your grace and kindness, and bring life and transformation to everyone here. We give you praise and thanks for it in Jesus' holy and matchless name, we ask it, amen. I want to give you this morning uh, a, a sermon that is really a but God testimony. If, if you're visiting with us today, you, you may have picked up on already that we've been sharing but God testimonies over these past few months coming into this year. And, and what a but God testimony is, is it's a, it's a moment in time uh, where the Lord intercepts us in our path and delivers us and saves us. It, uh, certainly begins uh, with our salvation, right? Uh, where, where God intercepts our life and, and we're headed down a path of uh, spiritual darkness and, and death because we are all sinners. And, and uh, somewhere along the way, the, the glory of the gospel, that message comes home to our hearts. God intercepts our path and delivers us, us from our sin through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, but then but God testimonies come throughout a, a believer's life, right? And so, so what I want to share with you this morning is the story of redemption, which is in itself a but God testimony. And, and I go to Isaiah 59. The backdrop of Isaiah 59 is the backdrop of human history. 
In Isaiah 59, the prophet Isaiah is speaking, prophesying, uh, thus saith the Lord. The Lord is using the mouth of Isaiah to declare his word to his people, the nation of Israel, a nation that God himself created. And friends, the fact that Israel is still a nation on planet earth today is only because of the grace of God that he created them. And that, that God will not let Israel fail. Because the Lord knows over the course of human history, many world leaders have tried to stamp out the nation of Israel and the people of the Jews. Right? right? So, so the very fact that Israel exists today is a testimony to the existence of the living God. Well, Isaiah, in his prophetic word, is prophesying to Israel, and the backdrop is dark. This is the plight of the people. This is the plight of Israel in that time. This is the plight of our nation today. It is the plight of all nations in all generations from the entrance of sin into the human race until this very day, and it will be until King Jesus comes again. The plight is sin. The plight is darkness. There, there is darkness over the nation of Israel Isaiah is prophesying to the, the nation of impending judgment that is going to come through the, to the southern kingdom known as Judah through their Babylonian exile. The Babylonians are going to come, uh, Isaiah is prophesying around 700 B.C., and, and the Babylonians are going to sweep into the southern kingdom in less than a century and they are going to take the southern kingdom of Judah captive. The Assyrians will have swept through by then and taken the northern kingdom of the nation of Israel captive. The southern kingdom stands at the threshold of experiencing the disciplining hand of God against her. She is an idolatrous people. She has forsaken the God who saved her. She has left her first love, if you will. She has forsaken her Lord and given herself to foreign gods, which are no gods at all. And so let's pick up the account in Isaiah 59 and let the word of God speak to your heart this morning. Verse 9, therefore justice is far from us, Isaiah says, the Lord says through Isaiah. Therefore justice is far from us and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light and behold, darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. We all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. Why? Why is this darkness over the people? Why, is, why are they feeling, why are they groping in the dark? Why are they stumbling at noontime when the sun is out? Why are they growling like bears? Verse 12, because our transgressions are multiplied before you and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us and we know our iniquities. What is Isaiah describing? There is a separation. There is a breach in the fellowship between God and his people, between his people and God. There's a breach, and the breach is caused by their sin. Verse 13, transgressing and denying the Lord and turning back from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words. Verse 14, justice is not only far from us, but Isaiah cries, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away for truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it. The Lord saw it. Let those words sink into our hearts this morning. The Lord sees it. The Lord saw it in Isaiah's day. He saw the darkness. He saw the evil of the day. Friends, today the Lord sees it. 
The, Lord, the Lord's eyes run to and fro throughout the earth, uh, the Bible says. He is looking for those whose hearts will worship him. And the Lord sees all of the wickedness going on on planet earth in every nation, named among every tribe and every people. The Lord sees. The Lord saw it. And it displeased him. The Lord sees it today, and it displeases him today, just as it did in Isaiah's day. What, what displeased the Lord? That there was no justice, the text says. That there was no justice. Look around the United States of America and what are people clamoring for? They are clamoring for justice, but there is no justice without Jesus Christ ruling, friends. Verse 16, he saw that there was no man. Here is the plight of the human race. There was no man. And wondered that there was no one to intercede. This is the desperation of humanity. This is the desperation of every nation, every tongue, every tribe. There is no man who will intercede. Then, then, verse 16, then his own arm brought him salvation. And who is the arm of the Lord, church? Jesus the Christ. There is no man on earth. There, there is no politician, there is no other leader, there is no preacher, preacher, there is no priest, there is no man. There is no man. And then the, his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. Oh, and what did this man do? Church, verse 17, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Listen, these are, these are the weapons of the Christian warfare, right? This is, you flash forward to Ephesians 6, this is the Christian armor. Listen, your armor, believer, is tried and true because King Jesus wore it first. He put on the breastplate of righteousness and came in glory. He put on the helmet of salvation. He is the breastplate of righteousness. He is the helmet of salvation, amen? Yes. Oh, he did that in his first advent, but I, I believe Jesus is coming again, and I, I believe the first half of verse 17 uh, is talking about what Jesus did in his first advent, his first coming. He put on righteousness as a breastplate. He put on the helmet of salvation on his head. He will yet, he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. See, I, see, I, I think that's describing the second coming Jesus is coming again, and, and when Jesus comes again, he, he came the first time to deliver salvation, to deliver good news, good tidings of great joy to men, the glory of the gospel of grace, an opportunity to come and eat and feast with God, an opportunity for the nations, not just the Jews, but the, the nations of the earth, an opportunity to come and drink deeply of the mercies of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins. But friends, he is coming again. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. He's coming again to bring vengeance, to bring judgment against those who persist in their stubbornness those who fail to acknowledge him, those who oppose him. Verse 18, according to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands he will render repayment, so they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, for he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives, and a redeemer will come to Zion. A redeemer is coming to Jerusalem. A redeemer has come to Jerusalem and a redeemer is coming again. He is coming again because he is risen from the dead. He is coming to those in Jacob who turn from transgressions, declares the Lord. And verse 21 says, and as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit that is upon you and my words that I've put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. Friends, this is the backdrop. This is the backdrop of Isaiah's day, and quite frankly, it is the backdrop of these days in the United States of America, but as I said, it is the backdrop of every generation. 
of every nation that has ever existed on planet Earth because humanity across the board, across culturally, we are all sin sick and rebellious against God. Not only does this kind of darkness envelop the nations, but it envelops every soul that is steeped in sin. But there is a God in heaven who is faithful to his promises. There is a God in heaven who is not far off. He is very near. In fact, not only is he very near, but he cares for your soul this very day. I don't know how much he cares for your soul. Howard read it in John chapter 19. He cares for our souls that much that the king of glory put on flesh, left the glories of heaven, put on humanity, put on human flesh, made himself of no reputation and suffered and died in your place and in my place. The question is, will we receive it? Will we receive it? See, see, when truth is nowhere to be found, as Isaiah describes in Isaiah 59, when truth is nowhere to be found, when, when Pilate says to Jesus, what is truth? And, and then our culture echoes that very sentiment. What is truth? There is no absolute. There, there are no absolutes. It's what the culture says. There are no absolutes. There are no truths. Any truth claims are, be de- are to be denied. Friends, when there is no truth, nowhere is to be found. God promises to send his son to embody the truth and to reveal the glory of the Lord. There was a but God moment found in Isaiah 59. It is that but God will stretch out his arm. From his own arm, he sends a deliverer. And the glory of the risen Lord washes upon his people. Let's go into chapter 60, shall we? Amen? Yes, we better go there because this is a dark place to live in. Verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 60, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. What a promise to a people steeped in darkness in Israel that day. What a promise to those here in the United States of America and around the world in 2022, a people group by by nation by nation steeped in darkness, needing hope. There is a deliverer. There is a deliverer, and that deliverer is full of glory, and he wants to shine his glory on you, church. He wants to shine his glory on the church and through the church. So so come a little closer, church, to Jesus. Get a little glory on you and start shining his glory in this culture. This is the message of the gospel, that today we, the church, are the the glory bearers of the Lord Jesus, that today we have the glory of Christ on us, and we are meant to reflect that glory to the nations. This is the imperative, right? Wake up and glorify the risen Son, this is, the, this, is, this is a command. Verse 1 is a command. Arise and shine, for the light has come, and it is on you. It is on you. Like the resurrection isn't just uh, something that happened some 2,000 years ago. It did happen 2,000 years ago. But no, 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 the, the implications of it are still going on today because the glory of, Lord, of the Lord for all who believe on Christ, for all who believe in the risen Savior, they get that glory on them and they get that glory in them and they, we are meant to shine. We are meant to reflect his glory. The resurrected Christ is the answer to the world's darkness The resurrected Christ is the light that dispels the darkness of the nation of Israel. It dispels the darkness of the world, and it will dispel the darkness of your soul if you receive Christ Jesus as your Savior. This darkness is sin, and the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only remedy that will overcome that darkness. Israel has glory on her today. Israel has glory on her today, although the nation itself rejects that glory. Jerusalem has glory on her. Jerusalem has the glory of the risen Christ on her. 
Because behold, a son has been brought forth and he lived a righteous and perfect life and died a sinner's death. And the wages of sin is death. But Jesus was no sinner. Jesus was no sinner. You and I are the sinners. And for sinners, Jesus came to die. Jesus, listen friends, Jesus did not come to heal those who are well. So if you're here this morning and you never trusted in Christ as your Savior, listen, you have to come to a place where you see your sickness. You see the sickness of your soul and a need for the great physician to heal you, to set you free from enslavement to sin, right? Israel has glory on her today. Uh, the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 5 declares the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jerusalem shines because her Messiah, whom she crucified, has risen from the grave in triumph. The risen Jesus is the only one who will overcome the thick darkness that resides over the peoples that is described in verse 2 of Isaiah 60. John chapter 8, verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you see another but God in, in verse 2? For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness, the peoples, but the Lord, but the Lord will rise upon you. The Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. This is a but God moment. The intersecting of the mercy and grace of God in the nation of Israel. It is the intersecting of the mercy and grace of God among the nations of the world. It is the intersecting of the mercy and grace of God for any and all who come in poverty of spirit to drink from living water and to eat of eternal bread. The scriptures declare in Isaiah 55, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come. You're poor, come. Buy and eat, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Stop putting your money in bags with holes in the bottom of the bag and come to the Lord Jesus. He alone satisfies the soul. The word of God says, listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, God says. You hear the plea of the heart of God for you. Come and eat. I'm offering you bread free of charge. I'm offering you salvation free of charge. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't pay me for it. He rejects all payments. All payments are a form of pride. He just says, come. Come and lay your soul before me and trust in me. He says, incline your ear and come to me here that you, your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast, sure love for David. Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 5, 8 through 10, for at one time you were darkness. Speaking of believers, right? At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try, he says, to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Ephesians 5.14 is a New Testament reflection of Isaiah 60. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. The resurrected Christ bids us today to rise and shine, friends. Rise and shine. Trust in the Lord. Get some glory on you and go shine for him. Get some glory. I like that. Get some glory on you. And then just go shine for the Lord Jesus. It's not, it's not my glory. It's not your glory. No, no, you shine your glory or my glory. No, no, no. It is the glory of the risen Savior. Bask in his glory and then shine. The glory of the risen Lord is attracting the nations, verses 3 through 9 of Isaiah 60. It's attracting the nations. The word of God continues, a nation shall come to your light. Is that happening today, church? 
Those of us who know, we, we, we see what God is doing among the nations, that, that, that God is still working in places like Europe and, and the United States, but I'll tell you, Western cultures, uh, where we live today, is become, increasingly becoming a mission field. Like, like this is a real life mission. We, are, we stand in need, church. Listen, listen to this. We stand in need of other nations sending missionaries to the United States. Come on, church. Come on, church. What are we doing? Shine for the glory of Christ. Lay aside our, idol, our idols and shine for the glory of Christ. Put away all of the things that we seek after, that, that we seek to satisfy the hungers of our heart and come back to Jesus who alone satisfies. Right? But, but God is on the move. Oh, God is on the move. He, he's, he's on the move in, in great ways down in South America. He's on the move in great ways on the African continent. Oh yeah, God is, God is on the move in various parts of the world where the gospel once struggled and where the gospel once flourished now is becoming increasingly godless and secular. Come on, friends. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. And I'm, I'm not just talking about those outside the church. I'm talking about us, we who live in the church, we who are faithful to the church. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. Less, a whole lot less of Jeff Malin, amen, and a whole lot more of Jesus. You put your name in there, right? <laughs> the glory of the Lord is attracting the nations. This is attractive. This is attractive. Man, these are wonderful words of hope spoken to a people standing in danger of imp an, an impending discipline at the hands of the Lord their God. Look at verse four. Lift up your eyes all around and see. Lift up your eyes and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar and your daughter shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exalt because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. Who doesn't want camels? <laughs> Pray on the camels, Lord. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. This is, this is shades of the days of Solomon, which were the richest days in the history of the nation of Israel. Hey, what is God saying? You, you come, you receive me. You come drink of this living water. You come and eat this bread, this living bread, and, and I will make you rich in me. I will be your riches. You will bask in the riches of God and his presence. And the New Testament says that believers are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. And, and in case you missed the headline news, all things have been given to Christ Jesus. Like, he owns everything. And as believers, we are co-heirs with him. You may never be rich on this side of glory, but on the next side of glory, you are going to have more wealth than you know what to do with. You're going to be rich in the presence of the glory of God. The results of this glory bath, right? Take a bath in the glory of God. I like that picture. Isaiah says you will, you will have a radiant spirit, a spirit, a, a soul that shines for the glory of God, a, a heart that will thrill and exalt in the praises of your Redeemer and God. Listen, there are just too many of us in the church today, and I count myself among them sometimes, who are just cranky. Why are we so cranky? Why am I so cranky? Because I'm not basking enough in the glory of the risen Savior, right? I'll tell you, this is a promise. This is a promise that we ought to pray, oh God, oh God, bathe me in your glory that I might have a radiant spirit. The results of, of drawing near to God is that, is that the glory of God would come upon us. And that's what happened to Moses. Moses draws near to God and he gets some glory on him. He goes back out amongst the people and they can't even look at him. The glory is so bright. He's got to veil his face. And we need, we need that kind of glory. 
2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 17, would it surprise you that in the New Testament, the Lord promises to those who believe in Christ that, that we will be bathed in glory and that we, unlike Moses, will not even have to veil our face. That you, church, today, like, like, like right now, well, let's do a little exercise. Inform your heart, I got glory on me. Like, like, and let it, let it relate and translate to our faces, right? Smile. Y'all are scaring me. <laughs> Second Corinthians 2, 14 through 17. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Oh, to, we are the aroma of Jesus to, to believers and to unbelievers. Paul says, to one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. And then he asks this question, who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. And then you jump down to 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. He says this, since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. Whose minds? Israel's minds. Hardened in unbelief, stiffened in rebellion, resistant to the word of God. For to this day, he says, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. See, the glory of the Lord is attractive. And the glory of the Lord upon the church and upon individual believers is meant to be attractive to the nations. Church, let's just confess that, that we we are at times unattractive. We are at times unattractive to the nations. We are unattractive to those who, who are not yet believers in Lenaway County. We are unattractive to them. I confess that even yesterday I was unattractive. I repented this morning. And God sent a little, little angel to me. Not, not a little angel, but a little angel just to remind me, right? <laughs> Marissa knows what I'm talking about. The glory of the Lord will shine forever. This, this light, you don't have to change the light bulb in the temple, right? That, that's good news to Baptists. How many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> I don't know. It takes two or three committees. I know that. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke, bad joke. The glory of the Lord will shine forever. Let me, let me just share with you just a few select verses from the rest of Isaiah 60. Verse 11 your gates shall be open continually. Day and night they shall not be shut. Skip down to verse 17 through the end of the chapter. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Huh? Who wants to be led by peace and righteousness? Sign me up. Peace and righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Verse 19, the sun shall be no more, your light by day, nor uh, for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. The least one shall become a clan, 
and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. It's shades of Revelation. It's shades of Revelation 21, where the Apostle John, writing under inspiration, says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. You skip down to the end of that chapter and I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. But its light, by its light, will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Right? Just what we read in Isaiah 60. And its gates will never be shut by day. There will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Right, that's what's coming. This glory is never going away. If it's shining in you today, it is on you forever. Amen? It is on you forever, and you're gonna like it you're going to love it. You should love it already, right? We should love it that the glory of God is already on us because Jesus has declared himself to be the victor and the victory. He stood in the temple and he read Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. So we keep reading in Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Jesus said, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's what Jesus came and did in his first advent. He's coming again. He's coming again, and when he comes again, the rest of verse 2 and 3 are going to be fulfilled. The day of vengeance of our God, which will be a comfort for all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. That's what's coming. That's what's coming. Are you ready? Right? Are are we ready? This Jesus that I'm proclaiming to you, he saves to the uttermost. He is the only risen Savior, and he's coming again. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So shine his glory. Shine his glory, church. Shine it in every dark corner and crack and crevice of Lenaway County and wherever else you go, shine the glory of God. Put on the fear of the Lord and let it shine as you live in his righteousness. Are your sins forgiven today? Are your sins forgiven today? Is Jesus your savior? Is his glory upon you? See, Friends, make no mistake about it. If his glory is on you, it's unmistakable. There will be be a difference in you. It's not about outward religious works and, and outward righteousness. Listen, the Pharisees put on a good religious show and Jesus said, you are full of deadness. You are the walking dead. So this isn't about works of religion. This is about a transformation of the soul. Have you believed on Jesus Christ? The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. And friends, God has demonstrated his love for you in his outstretched arms. Even that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, the Bible says. And because if we confess now with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you call on him today? I don't know the state of your soul this morning, but I, in a moment I'm gonna pray, and I'm gonna give you opportunity. You can cry out to him right now before I even start. You don't need the preacher to lead you to the throne of God. Jesus gave himself on the cross. The veil was torn in two. He says, come and drink. If you're thirsty and you want salvation in Christ, you start drinking right now. Put your mouth up to that water hose and take it. It will refresh your heart. Your sins will be forgiven. Come and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Put your faith only in him and what he has accomplished. His finished work. Jesus alone has the righteousness that will deliver us. Jesus says your righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees. And, and there's only one righteousness that exceeds the, Pharisee, the Pharisaical righteousness and that is the righteousness of Jesus. But you have to come to him repentant and ask him to forgive you of your sins and he will clothe you with his righteousness. Not because you deserve it. Not because you're worthy of it. You're not. You're not deserving of it. You're not worthy of it. Neither am I. None of us is. But he'll do it because he is a God of grace. And he loves you that much. Will you come? Father, I pray that even now, there's anyone in this room that does not have the forgiveness of sins, that does not have your glory upon them, I pray, Father, that they would even cry out in their hearts something, something of genuine repentance, Lord. That they would even pray a, a genuine prayer in their spirit of, God, I, I know that I'm a sinful person. Darkness is my problem. I live and I bask in sin, not in glory. I want my soul to be set free. I believe that Jesus Christ is the righteous one, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and that means he can take away my sin. Oh God, I pray, believing on Christ, asking that you would forgive me of my sin and cleanse me. I pray, Father, this morning that if there are folks in here this morning who do not know Christ as their Savior, they're doubtful of their salvation, that they would cry out to you, turn from their sin and confess it and and trust their hearts, their souls, to the Lord Jesus. Oh God, help your church to shine. God, we just confess and acknowledge that we are at times very dim reflectors of your glory. God, we still wrestle with sin. We still struggle. Oh Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Help us to yield our hearts to him every moment of every day, that he might fill us and we might walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And God, let your church shine. Raise up your church in the United States. Raise up your church around the world. Raise up your church in Europe. Raise it up in South America and Australia. Father, in Africa, in Asia. God, raise up your church. Raise up your body and let your body shine forth the glory of the risen Savior. We'll do it for your glory's sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Mm -hmm.